I think copywriters, to be honest, uh, they're also good at influencer marketing. They're good at writing YouTube scripts. Copywriting is like the basis of everything. And marketing is not an eight to five job. You cannot just wake up and do every day the same. This is thinking job. And the most important thing that I have done while doing outreach was the fact that I will not only invest time in what I can get now, but I will invest time in what I can get in one year. You're not going to win this if you don't do outreach. That's for sure. That for me is the future. If you don't understand your audience, you're dead. If you have clients like most of us have, the return of investment is key. I have seen a lot of people paying a lot of money and then going, this is not good. I don't feel represented by this. Yeah, but it's not about you. It's about the people who are going to read it. Probably you as copywriter, when you check the things that you have wrote, you ask yourself, was this a hit or was not a hit? And how do I measure that? If AI can do my job even better than I do, what use is for me? Podcast The Best, czyli Daniel Bawi edukuje, słucha i tłumaczy. Podcast dla copywriterów, którzy chcą zarabiać więcej hajsu. Siema, dzisiaj mamy kolejny odcinek z gościem anglojęzycznym i tym razem zostawię Ci instrukcję, jak obejrzeć go z napisami, jeśli masz problem z językiem angielskim. Jak jesteś na YouTubie, klikasz tę ikonkę koła zębatego, klikasz napisy angielski wygenerowane automatycznie. A następnie przetłumacz automatycznie i bierzesz sobie polski. Today we have a second episode in English because I have a specialist from abroad. We met in one of my previous workplaces and we've built a relationship. A relationship that lasts until today, even though he lives in South America and I live in Europe. And relationships will be the main theme of today's episode as they are the foundation of outreach marketing. I present you an outreach marketing specialist, Fernando Valone. What's up? Hi, Daniel. What's up? Long time no see. (laughs) Um, it's it's been a it's been a while thank you for having me and inviting me you know to speak about outreach which is something i'm very passionate about and which actually is much more than most people think so i know what question would you like to start with the first question is mandatory what was the last thing you wrote for money oh that's a good one um a template (laughs) <laughs> for an email marketing campaign, which right now is, I'm not going to say hell, but thanks, you know, to the Gmail Yahoo update from February, it's kind of complicated. It has presented so many challenges, and especially for those big senders uh, that were sending half a million emails, you know, for cold sales, for link building, for any type of those efforts it has been a game changer. So I've been working hard on that. A game changer for the worst. Now, I mean, you get to understand something. If you leave of sending 500 emails, you know, cold emails, and you want something from there, yeah, it's for the worst. Because now you need to have the main emails, the right configuration. You need to be sure you're pitching to the right place unsubscribe is easier and easier and the unsubscribe rate it always go up you know and it's kind of a spam score now but on the other hand the idea is that this will help spam stop which is something for example i have to deal (laughs) every day of my life so from the user point of view this is great and from you know our side I wouldn't say it's bad. I would say it's a challenge and it demands you to become better. And it demands you to have conversation with your clients where you have to be very clear about now this is what you can do and you cannot go that way. But if you think so, um, you know, all those emails of, I am from a remote country and I have money, 
uh, they're not going to fly. And, you know, I in my 30s, close, close to my 40s. So for me, it's pretty obvious nobody is going to give me a million dollars. But you need to understand that everyone in this world have access to an email. Uh, and there are people that are going to fall for that. So it's it's right to protect them uh, for that, for phishing, for any type of of issue that these spam emails can create. Yeah, I, I kind of like it. Uh, it kind of reminds me, resembles of the helpful content update and uh, mm -hmm. the Google's anti-spam score uh, policy that they are cutting out the shitty content. And people were also whining, like, why did my website drop? I had so much traffic and I have none. It cut, it was cut by 50%. And uh, I, I don't, I can't make a living. Like, write better content for fuck's sake. It was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Write, I think... write useful content. It's it's not mm. that hard to write a useful content. It's uh, writing content for for, uh, for Google now is more than just, okay, I'll take this heading, heading from this article. I take this from this, uh, this one. Uh, I'll write it in my words, my own words, my own <laughs> words, and uh, and that's it. And and hope for my domain to rank it high. And yeah, it makes sense. When I started um, the SEO career, you know, my first steps was in copywriting. Very bad copywriting. Nothing like what you do. It was like eight years ago, a little more, and it was those classic five places you cannot miss this summer. And it was very bad. It was like, just put 500 words, paste two links, ready to go. You know, that these days, that doesn't fly. And funny enough, I stopped trusting the internet after working as a copywriter because I used to have to Google things. I was like, I will do my best and it will fly. I think any optimization is good for the user. And if you're a specialist, it tends to be good for the specialist too. It just presents a challenge and you need to work through that challenge and you cannot just, you know, ignore it. It's not going to go away and you cannot just keep doing the same thing you used to do. So it makes all of us better. And that's a good thing. So it's more like evolution rather than killing a part of the business I also like it. It's user friendly, after all. Like it's not helping us, but it's user friendly, and we're also users. Yeah, it's also focus on critical thinking if you want to be good at this. Like in the past, it used to be very simple. You know, do an outreach campaign. When I started, you, I used to send emails that were to any website and say, "Hey, I have an article I want to publish. Do you want content for free?" And they will say, yeah, sure, give it to me. And there was a link there, very simple. Eventually, I have to, you know, um, improve all my skills and learn new things like A-B testing, like technical, the technical side of what is, is an email, the type of domain, you know, like then again, working with databases, filtering emails, there is like a huge thing there that demands that you get to know more and more. And if you do not apply critical thinking, you get stuck. Probably you as copywriter, when you check the things that you have wrote, you ask yourself, was this a hit or was not a hit? And how do I measure that? Because at the end of the day, especially if you have clients, if you're doing this because you're just passionate, okay, that's cool, you know. But if you have clients like most of us have, the return of investment is key. In the past, there was no return of investment because now we have all these metrics and all this software that can, you know, give the numbers. You have to be able to work with that data, which... It's impressive how many people don't really collect their data or don't have reports about or don't make decisions based on the data. And I'm not saying you have to follow the data all the time. That's why you're an expert. That's why you have to be able to see trends. But at the end of the day, the client wants to see. So if you're a professional and you're not asking yourself why this, this thing I create was not as successful as this other, you're not gonna survive 
uh, these new updates, especially with all the AI new things that are coming. I will give you an example. I am seeing a lot of spam um, messages, you know, with that's clearly they put, they incorporate AI to the spam uh, filter bot or software they're using or the server, whatever. I'm starting to receive very strange emails that I didn't use to receive. You know, you, you, you usually get the classic one with the code uh, that tells you exactly, is this hard bounds? Is this a soft bounce? Now I got one that say that the inbox doesn't understand what's the intention of the email. So it got blocked. And that was the first one I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like now I have to, what do you mean with the intention? So I could just say, well, that's just one thing or I can take that as a sign of the things that are going to come. And that for me is, okay, let's take this in inbox and let's do a lot of A-B testing. And I want to pitch different things from different emails to the exact same inbox and learn what pass and what gets rejected. Because if this grow and I start seeing this, I need to be able to, you know, be prepared. So that's why I think, you know, the, the professionals that want to stay specialists and that love challenges are going to love this new era. The ones that were selling a very simplified system to their clients and they were not really paying attention to the results, they're going to hate this. And it might be, it might not be, but I think a lot of agencies are struggling right now with this. And you're probably going to see a lot of them evolving from the type of service they gave or going down. The critical thinking you, you mentioned, like it is critical, like AI all loves the world critical, crucial and critical. So yeah, like if, if you don't have the reflection, the ability to, to reflect, like to think what is happening and to come up with conclusion, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're going down. Yeah. You're going down. And a lot of people also in my industry in, in copywriting, they are reflectless, so to speak. I don't know if it, it's, if such word exists, but um, yeah, conclusionless, or should I say brainless even mm -hmm. they, they, all they want is just to receive guidelines, the, the main keyword maybe the tool with keywords like surfer or a uh, neuron writer and that's it and receive money for it and that's it and they're they're going down because ai can do it as well people yeah. need something more marketing is not an eight to five job you cannot just wake up and do every day the same this is a thinking job and you need to be smart enough to try to keep you know updated but also I think that when everything is going on the right way and you're achieving success, something inside of you need to be asking what's next. And I think a lot of the reactions to all these updates are because a lot of people don't want to ask what's next. They wanted to just have a career where it was very easy to do what they did. They were already on top of their game and now this changed everything again. But that's marketing. We're not the same as a hundred years ago. Banking, that's probably a career where you can go and do eight to five job if you just manage opening new accounts, for example. And even then you have to update on the technology, but somebody do that for you. When it comes to work on any marketing strategy, there is so much more in there. And again, this needs to be a passion for you. It's not something you can do if you're not passionate, you need to do the research. And yes, we have gurus and experts and people that give great advice, but at the end of the day, you are the one that needs to make the decision and you're the one that's gonna know how to evolve or not. And what's the price that we're gonna pay for that? I always surprised by people who are experts and for some reason, their first reaction is, this is not going to stick. You know, we're going to leave. And I don't need to think about this. And you always want to think about this. I have seen this with AI. 
there has been a lot of conversation and a lot of people saying, well, you know, AI is, is not really going to be there uh, as people think. It's not going to take people's job. It's not going to evolve to the point where it can make my job. And my position is, yes, it is going to happen. It's already happening. We need to prepare and I need to be useful uh, for a company, for a client. If you're not profitable, what is the point of being there? And let's be honest, is if a software, if AI can do my job even better than I do, what use is for me? So unless you keep pushing yourself to the next stage, uh, you're not going to survive. And sometimes pushing yourself to the next stage, it also means being able to say, I'm not smart enough to win this. I need to bring new people or I need somebody with more talent than myself or more experience than myself or even younger than myself and work with them so I can stay on top, which is something it's complicated these days. And I think we're getting there eventually. All the agencies and companies will get there. But right now, uh, there is this tendency of we will wait and see what happened or we don't think this is going to truly happen. And it's already happening. You mentioned the passion for, for the things you do and your passion is outreach marketing. And let's, mm -hmm. let us talk about what outreach marketing yeah. really is. Yeah, usually if you Google it, it will give you some funny results. It's going to be... <laughs> I always love... Uh, the results that just tell you how to do outreach and it's you just need to be on their social media establish some engagement and then contact them and ask them something you know and it's like no it doesn't work like that i had a boss that wanted to do that and what i had to explain to them is what is your value online for asking for something to a person that do have a value for you, you know? And they were like, yeah, but just create an account and engage with them. And it's, yeah, but you're, you know, you don't have nothing on any LinkedIn, for example, on Google, there's nothing about you. So why you're asking for something? Key factor here is he doesn't need to be there. Uh, he doesn't need to have a great LinkedIn. He doesn't need to be an influencer, but you cannot ask things for free. I don't have nothing else to give. So outreach, I think the best way to, to define is outreach is a process. In itself, I don't think it's a product or a service alone. I think outreach is always a part of the strategy that guarantee the strategy is going to work. If you take something like link building, you will find a lot of people telling you, I don't want to do outreach. I just want to buy links from a marketplace and put it there. And usually it's congratulations. Uh, you just bought a site that millions of people have. And if they are in a marketplace, usually that means they just gave up. You know, uh, most of the sites that you really want to get a link into, they're going to say no, and they're not going to be on a marketplace. So outreach, for example, in link building, guarantee that you get the best links you can get and guarantee also the best price you can get, but is also a great way of getting free links. The issue is you need time for that and you need to build a complete strategy. That means you need scraping. You need to be able to filter those emails and guarantee that those are the right emails to contact. And then you need to probably use a software to pitch these ones. But it's not just pitching. Subject line matters. Uh, the content of the template matters. The follow-up matters. And then the negotiation also matters, you know, when somebody replied to you, there is need to be a protocol for that. And there are all these little things that guarantee that you're going to do great outreach. Now that's for link building. I have done outreach for influencer marketing. It's not that different, but the main thing is you have to focus a lot on the human interaction. 
is the same when you're trying to sell a product, when you're trying to sell any service, you know, um, it's not a simple of just send the email, it needs a structure and it will give you a lot of value and you will get a lot of return for investment from, from outreach, but you have to do it right. I think the main issue with outreach is A, people don't understand it, B, a lot of people speak of outreach like a magic thing. As I was saying at the first, you know, like just get a link on this amazing site, uh, speaking with this person, and that's not gonna happen. Even when you do digital PR and you want to publish something for your client, you need to approach these, um, you know, professionals and pretty sure uh, with a presentation, you know, an infographic, something that matters. And if you go to a lot of agencies, you will see that they have infographic uh, outreach or infographic marketing, and it's not exactly the same. Outreach is great for all the marketing efforts, but you need to know what you're doing and you cannot expect magic from it. But what guarantee is that you actually get the best that you can get without going to the same places that everyone goes. And that on the long run, it helps your campaign and it helps you achieve a lot of things. One of the most important things is through outreach, you can have great data because you already know what's replay rate, what's the conversion rate, all those. But also every person you contact, it's a future database. So if you invest on organizing that database, that helps you to maximize any future effort. And I'm amazed that a lot of people don't understand the you know, uh, the power of having their own database. And they're like, no, I don't want to have a database. I prefer to pay this marketplace. In the end, when all these updates come, you see them suffer because of it. But I think, you know, hard work always pays better than just trying a quick solution. But it depends how much you want to be on this game. Maybe you want to pump up uh, site and then sell it really fast. So probably, yeah, you want just, you will go and buy a zillion links on a marketplace and that's right now, that's not gonna work anymore. Or you actually want to be there, you want to be a company, you want to matter in the long run. In that, if that's the case, you need outreach and nothing else. And the most important thing that I have done while doing outreach was the fact that I will not only invest time in what I can get now, but I will invest time in what I can get in one year. So when I was doing link building, for example, which is the most associated thing with outreach, I will contact a lot of sites. And a lot of these sites were not really suitable for the client, but I knew that if the expected grow keeps is going to be in a year or three months or nine months and if I establish a conversation now and i keep that conversation going which doesn't need so much engagement from the person managing that inbox it will pay off and it will i will get probably a free link or even a very cheap link that matters for the client so you know it's a you're not gonna win this if you don't do outreach. That's for sure. You got me thinking, cause mm -hmm. after all, when I look back at this podcast, I can say it kind of fits in the outreach strategy, even though I didn't know it does, because like I'm talking to people, I'm reaching out to people and I'm establishing relationships and who knows, maybe in three months, six months, a year from now, I will have something for them or I will see them having something for me. So it makes sense. Yeah, it's, I mean, it comes from real life. Uh, when you work with someone, you establish, you know, uh, people you like to work with, professionals, and you keep uh, the communication, not because you're waiting one day this person is gonna 
you know, give me a job or anything, but it's because uh, that's the way doors are open. Somebody say, I think I know the guy for this, and they recommend you. I have got a lot of clients for people that I worked with eight years ago saying, I know somebody that can do it, but I also know somebody that's going to be honest with you and is going to tell you, yes, this is the right moment to invest on this, or I think you need to develop other things first, which it sounds like not a good idea if you're trying to sell your services. But at the end of the day, you cannot sell anything you do for a person that's not ready. And you can help them understand that because somebody else is going to sell them. And you can wait and see, maybe they will come in the future, maybe they will not, but you did a good job. And usually that establish a relationship with you. You know, like somebody thinks of you and say, I didn't work with this person, but he was honest enough to tell me, I don't think this is for you right now. And I had clients that came one or two years after, and they were, Fernando, I think now we're ready for it. Can you come and have a conversation with us, check our numbers and see how this looks? And I usually did. And yeah, some of them are ready for it. I always believe, and I always compare outreach to when you do freelance work and you charge by the hour. And myself, I don't charge for meetings. I, I don't understand people that put a price on the meetings because the meetings is kind of the reporting of what you did. You cannot charge for the work and then go to a meeting and say, oh, this is on, you know, on the ticket too. The clock is running because you need to explain yourself and you need to teach them. So how can you put a price on that? And that has opened a lot of doors for me as, you know, um, some of my old bosses have opened doors for me. So I think outreach is kind of that spirit in the end, like you give something, the other person gives something to you, but you're not really trying to, uh, how can this, you know, advance my career? You're just trying to have a relationship. And outreach tries to be that. Of course, you have to push that when you're doing influencer marketing, when you're doing link building, when you're doing digital PR, when you're doing sales, because there is a goal and somebody's investing money in there. But if it looks cold and just a transaction, you will see most people will never reply. So in spirits, it's kind of the same. And you do outreach with this. Got it. I, I have an impression that in Poland, we don't believe in outreach. We don't like outreach. Outreach is, it's not sexy. It's not like uh, I'm going to pay a thousand bucks for, for a link or for someone to do something and it's instant. Uh, I'm not going to invest in something that may or may not pay off in a year or so. I'll, 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 I want to do it. I just want to do it. I want to do it fast. Mm -hmm. I want to do it with minimum effort. Um, there are these marketplaces and uh, let's let's just go and buy link and if, if a website is not on the marketplace i'll just go there and ask them how much and uh, maybe it's just my impression but i think i think that uh, people in at least in link building in poland i like, i don't know the the other branches but uh, i've got this impression what do you think of it it's kind of what type of strategy do you have you know you can I mean, it's it's very difficult to actually understand the the mentality of a complete country. I did have a client from Poland, so I remember having conversations with them. This lot long time ago, and they were trying to tell me just do links in comments. I was like, that that's not good. You can't do that. But they wanted that, and they actually did that. And for a moment, it looked like they were right, they achieved success, and then they crash because it was obvious it was going to crash. I understand that a person that is managing business wants to see success right now, and they found no value uh, you know, uh, on having someone negotiate those sites or actually 
trying to get those links for them because they are like kind of junk food, you know? I can go to McDonald's and eat a hamburger with fries uh, and it will be very cheap. Why would I like to go to a restaurant that's going to serve exactly the same, probably with a different experience? And the thing is, even on the budget side, you it will be very smart to invest in having your own system and doing outreach. All those sites in the marketplace, they are usually managed by a third party vendor. They overcharge on those links because of course they need to get something from it. They're not gonna do it just for the love of doing it. And even if you have one or two people doing outreach, you probably can even get those sites cheaper if you contact them directly. So even as a simple thing in outreach as just go and contact this list of sites, I actually want to get links. It will help you compare, I am overpaying for this. And um, yeah, sure, probably if you're doing 10 links a month, you will be, oh, this is great. I don't have to manage a team. I don't have to pay salary. Let's keep going. If you're doing 50, you probably want to do that. If you're doing 100, you definitely want to do that. And on the other side, outreach goes much more than just go and buy links because a lot of the good sites, the sites that are relevant for you, are not really going to be there. But also what anybody else offers you is probably not going to be enough. I was doing some consulting uh, recently and I had a um, client told me they published a link in The Sun, the newspaper from UK, which is a big one. And he was like, I pay 500 pounds for it. And I opened that link and there was no follow. And he didn't know it was no follow because he also didn't understand that. So when you do outreach, you also are able to understand what else I can do, you know, to to win this competition. I'm on it. And usually that will help you grow. That will help you experiment. That will help you say, okay, but I just don't, I don't want to just mention in a, you know, in a keyword, uh, in an article related to X thing. I actually want brand awareness and I want this effort to guarantee that. And they speak about my brand and that they dedicate an article and that's not going to fly with those marketplace sites. But it will fly if you do outreach and you do it well, of course. Uh, you can, of course, contact a site and ask how much for this. There's huge probability you're going to end in spam and you're not going to be able to get out of there. So I think mostly is the appreciation of where it takes you while doing outreach. And I understand again, if it's a budget thing uh, or if it's a client that don't really want anything else, or if they're just starting to do this and they have here, oh, you have to do link building or you have to get published articles. But there is so much more out there that you get because of outreach that you will miss if you know you just pay and get links from a marketplace. You can even enter Fiverr, which is a big platform of freelancer, and you will see people posting, I will get you a link in Forbes uh, for $50. Um, I'm not going to say that that's not going to happen. I will say I really would not trust how that link is going to look. Siema, nadal oglądasz ten odcinek, więc pewnie coś Ci się w nim podoba. Co to takiego? Napisz w komentarzu. Jednocześnie standardowa prośba o suba dla YouTube'a, lajka dla Spotify'ka. Przypominam, że w opisie będzie link do bezpłatnego kursu o tym, jak zarabiać więcej hajsu z copywritingu, 4 godziny solidnego materiału, 150 osób już go pobrało, także zachęcam również Ciebie. To tyle z przerwy reklamowej, oglądaj dalej. Siema. That's interesting. So, <laughs> what do you mean by I wouldn't trust how this link would look? 
like what does it mean like it's gonna be somewhere deep in the structure or i don't know well probably forbes it is going to publish a link uh depending on the value that brings depending if you I don't know, let's say you contact a writer for them and they agree because, you know, their link is really good. Probably all the really good journalists are going to tell you, no, I'm not going to do that. But let's say you find one, okay? But it's always surprising to me that people trust the internet on so many things. And then they are like, why this fail? Copywriting, for example. Um, I get, probably you, you get this too on everyone in the industry. I get all these LinkedIn messages that are like, uh, dear sir, I will get you blah, 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 you know, and usually in outreach is like, I have block of high quality, that type of thing. But I do get from time to time, somebody writing saying, dear sir, I will actually write content for you. Uh, and the last one I saw, it was like uh, 20 cents a page. You know, and I was like, what am I going to get for 20 cents a page? I, and it's kind of, that's why I say sometimes people are surprised then when they hire these incredible cheap services and they're like, I'm so smart, I got it cheap. And they're like, yeah, of course you got a lot of crap because you pay for a lot of crap. A way of thinking of that is, will you do your own job for that money? And it amazed me how many of these people don't think that way. Uh, I was explaining to a client, he was telling me he got a couple of calls with agencies and for him, it was overpriced. And then he went into a forum, which is something I have not heard in the last 10 years. You know, like he probably went to Reddit and there was somebody there that was hoping to do all the work uh, for, 25% of the agency price. Uh, what I explained to them is like, yes, an agency is expensive. And usually you have to pay more. They have structure in place. They have employees. There is a complete need there. They're, if they are charging you $500, run. I mean, like really run because that's not really an agency. But they actually have a system in place, you know, and probably the person that wants to do it, probably they're just starting uh, or they don't have the amount of experience they need and they are doing this for you and 10 other persons to get their complete monthly salary equivalent and they're not gonna really focus on what you need. And I know this because I have this discussion with some colleagues and one of them was i just dedicate 10 hours a month a client and that's all for the amount of money they pay and in outreach that's really low like how you guarantee anything and they're more burning from the side of I will get as much client as I can. I get the first payment. And then if it works, it works. If not, it doesn't, I will get another one. And that cannot be, you know, good for the client. So pricing, if you want to understand how to do it, you just have to sit down and think of your own business of what you do, even if it's outside of marketing and ask yourself, how much will I charge for this? And if another person is telling, oh, I will do it, you know, 25% of the price I'm offering, will I trust that person? Or will I be, that is a scam? Usually it's a scam. Yeah, that's that's actually kind of prevalent in our business, in our industry, yeah. in, in copywriting. I, 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 I remember this quote by, um, Rory Sutherland that any fool can sell for cheaper. Any fool. Like you can sell anything to anyone if you make it cheaper. But the price that comes with it, like some people have set prices because of something. Because of uh, as you said, like uh, I can dedicate to this client, to this project, 10 hours a month in within the pay that he's paying. 
I cannot mm -hmm. charge more because you want to do your due diligence. You want to deliver quality. Um, and if the client wants more quality, they need to pay more for more of your time. And some people don't respect it. They don't respect their time. They don't respect their money. They just want to do a lot of things for maybe not so a lot of money, but they want to do a lot, a lot for a lot of people. And then the quality suffers. And as the quality suffers, you need to go lower and lower with your price. Eventually, you're going out of the business because you cannot survive for the money you charge. And I'm glad you mentioned this because I think it's a plague in marketing. Like Everyone wants to convince the client that they're going to do more for less, but it doesn't add up. It's not a business thing. It cannot work like this. No, it, that, that is right what you're saying and um, it goes also when you pay a professional um the professional also will tell you as i was saying before yes it's a good idea or no it's a good it's not a good idea i have say to potential clients you need to hire you know a sale on site before trying to do this because your site is not good or you need to work on the content on your site uh, you need to optimize that. And I can do that, but I can recommend you somebody or you can go out and look it. And after that is done, let's speak again in three months, you know, or in six months. Um, even when doing digital PR or brand awareness, uh, uh, there is a lot of conversation of what material do you have and how it looks. A lot of people think is just go and reach out to people and I will give you an example, get me on a podcast or get me, you know, on an interview or those kind of things. Or I want to be a speaker on this event. And it's like, are you prepared for that? Do you have what it takes to look as good as you know you are when you get the opportunity or you just want the opportunity and you don't understand how you're going to fail if everything doesn't look great. And that's a big conversation when you're doing brand awareness and PR, because if your website is not a killer, once you get the attention of the people you wanted, then what are you going to do? Uh, because they might not trust you. And with the speakers, for example, uh, I have multiple clients that were, we have, you know, um, secured this position. Can you help us to create a presentation for it? And I'm like, yes, yeah, sure, show me what you have. And they show me what they have. And it's like, you really need a, a graphic designer for this. And you need to practice this. And also, what is the post plan of this? because this is going to be available online after you finish. What are you are going to do with that resource? You're going to let it there, or you're going to try to do some PR and get sites that are in your niche and that are relevant to speak about that and link to that. And they are like, well, but why doesn't it link to my site? And it's like, because there is no value in your site if they don't go there and say, oh, OK, I saw what this guy was speaking about. I will Google him and I will find exactly what I want from him. I think there is a misunderstanding of what the success of strategy is and how you create a strategy. But mostly, and this is something that I'm seeing more and more, people want instant uh, results. And in any strategy, you're not going to get them. It's not going to happen. I have developed affiliate programs and I always tell them, you need to be patient and you need to sit down and do the work and be open to feedback and also be open to the feedback that, hey, your product doesn't look that good or the competition is killing you because it's cheaper. So what else you are offering that they don't offer or what is in, you know, for the person we're trying to get on this affiliate program? And those conversations require a respect from the person that is hiring you and an understanding that I'm going to trust this person because this person is the expert and 
that usually is complicated for some people that are just starting with this, especially with pe for people that has been successful in the past and they make the mistake of thinking they will also be successful on this. Um, it surprised me how many clients don't really understand that popularity and success are not the same thing. If you want to be popular, sure, we can have a conversation about having a TikTok for your brand. If you want to be success, you need a structure and you need a bigger plan for it. And I think that is key. That is nice. That is nice because um, I also heard a similar thing from Alex Hormozzi and he said something like this, that people over focus on the marketing and under focus on the quality of the product. Because if, you ha if your product is shit and you get it in front of more people, then the more people will know your product is shit. That, and that's, that's the yeah. thing. And... It, I, for example, copywriting, right? Uh, you guys, uh, I have no copywriters that are insanely good, like insanely good. They also use AI to, you know, enhance their abilities and they're still good. <laughs> I know I have had conversation of copywriting is not just an article of 3000 words. If you want to optimize on the e-commerce store uh, and you want to be better, you need to hire a copywriter to actually write the product page. Even if it's as simple as, I want to know what this product's done. A copywriter is key for that. You cannot do that on AI, so don't go to ChatGPT and ask to do it because that's not gonna fly. And a copywriter guarantee the same quality for all the site. That's why it's so important to hire a specialist and ideally, to hire one specialist that can manage other copywriters. For example, if it's too much work and you have to optimize too many things. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. And they are like, but why I need a copywriter just to stick some words and put it in there is the same, you know, uh, product that the others are selling. I'm just going to steal their description. And yeah, but everyone is doing that. So how do you stand? You know, like you look more like a supermarket that somebody that's actually giving something to the user and Google not only knows that, the user know that. That's why a lot of this work is, I want to guarantee that people go into your site or go check your product. But at the end of the day, it's on you if that's going to sell or is not going to sell. All this other work is a platform for your moment to shine. For me, copywriting is essential for that moment. I have recommend even hiring copywriters for pitch because they are, I have this great pitch. I want to go to investors and I am like, you need copywriter for this because even if you have the words in your mind, they are the ones that know how to make it work. Just speak with them, tell them, have long conversations, which is something a lot of people are not open to because they have this mentality of, I know what, you know, I did because I did it myself. And it's like, yeah, but somebody else can do it better. You just need to have a lot of conversations with them and explain your point of view and explain why your product is better or service is better and then allow them to do it and trust them to do it because I have seen a lot of people paying a lot of money and then going, this is not good. I don't feel represented by this. Yeah, but it's not about you. It's about the people who are going to read it. So, yeah. Hell yeah. That's <laughs> gosh. Hallelujah. Somebody finally said it. Like it's, uh, I, I heard it a few times that I don't like it. My client told me I don't like it. And I told <laughs> them like, it's, it's, whether you like it or not, it's not the point. It's about the whether your client will like it. So even if you, I may not like it. I may not like the my work. I may not like my copy. And my client may not like my copy. That's not the case. It, the case is that the client of my client will like it. And it's 
he's the only person that's supposed to like it. Like nothing else matters by my side. That for me is the future. If you don't understand your audience, you're dead. Uh, and you can see this in social media. You see all these big brands struggling to build their, you know, social media. And they're like, but we are so important and we're so popular and we have sold so much. How can it be that people don't engage with us? And <laughs> I know professionals that have told them, because you don't hire the people to do it and you don't trust them. There, there was a lot of, in my country, there is this case of, uh, I will say a popular brand of soda, you know, uh, one of those knockoff from Coca-Cola that they don't taste that good. So they were always like, you know, very focused on, we're really cheap, man. <laughs> you can get us really cheap. And they, somebody, I don't know who, ends giving the um, Instagram actually account to somebody very young, probably in their 20s. And they were clearly not paying attention and they were just posting like, you know, like the, this flavor is $1, okay, great. And this kid, while nobody was paying attention, he created an, a meme account from that brand. And he makes so many jokes that were, that make sense in the context and that speak from daily events. And he even laugh of the comparisons they used to do. And it, it was a massive success. And suddenly, a lot of young people uh, will just consume the product because, they, because it was so good and it made them laugh. And I think that was amazing. And then somebody in that company paid attention and was like, hey, what the hell is going on in here? Get that kid out. Yeah, yeah, because they are like that. Get that kid out. And the kid even just, you know, say bye on the social media. He's uh, uploading a meme. And their social media died. Because and you, you're surprised by the fact that they don't understand their own audience. And I can imagine a meeting where they are. Well, our audience is uh, family, uh, one girl, one boy. Um, you know, mom, dad, uh, they don't, they don't get paid as much as, you know, uh, probably professional, like a doctor or a lawyer. So these are day to day people, uh, we want to sell a cheap product for them. And then there was this kid who would do us like, let's have fun because we are cheap and that's, that's the truth. And we cannot lie about that. And we cannot come and say, Oh, we're the option to Coca-Cola. Let's just have fun about that. And they got people outside of their target to consume it because it was fun. And yeah, they did it. So understanding your audience is really important. I have done influencer marketing, outreach for influencer marketing, and you could see how everything was changing. YouTubers, they will answer an email and they will say, hey, yeah, let's have a conversation. They will speak about metrics and that. When we're moving to other uh, platforms, the younger the influencers were, the strange their responses got. I once got, we sent an offer for like $1,000 for one video. Uh, this was Latin America, so it was a lot of money for them. And the guy answered too much text. And that was the only one. And I was like, wait, what? And yeah, it was too much text for him. So we rewrite it. And, you know, we send a new email, say, hey, how it looks a thousand for a video. And then they answer, yeah, I want to do that. It, it was like, well, you have to understand your audience too. Because if not, they're not going to reply to you. Uh, that's the... <laughs> That's not like if I saw a thousand dollars in a in a message to me, I I would read the fucking Wikipedia if I needed to. <laughs> I will Google the company, tag you know everything. <laughs> but the truth is, uh, you don't only work for yourself; you work 
for the audience and clients okay. tend to believe you work for them. And it's like, I'm helping you with this issue. I'm not helping you to be happy with yourself. The only thing that matter is that you sell and you're profitable. So let's work on that. Yeah, that there's this, uh, this, this movie with uh, Alexandra Daddario, uh, where she's um, a marketing expert in, mm -hmm. in a company and they're selling some uh, bio stuff uh, with chips along, uh, chips or crisps, depending on the region you are. The little, mm -hmm. but the, I think that that was corn or potato thingy to munch when you're doing some stuff. And the sales yeah. are bad of this product. And they, um, and the company requested a research on on the persona, on the buyers group. And uh, they came up with the conclusion that their target group is uh, a millennial. That millennials are their target audience. Uh, and the girl said like, but my grandpa loves these chips and his friends love these chips. They could eat a ton of it in a day. They're, they mm -hmm. they go bowling, they drink beer and they're eating these chips like crazy. Like, why don't we sell to them? <laughs> and the guy says, because they're not our target group. Our target group is a millennial. Like, what do, what don't you understand? <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm not gonna go go with the spoiler. Uh, I encourage you to watch the movie. <laughs> I will or watch. If you don't want, if you don't want to, I, I'll tell you. But uh, it was funny to me. Like the movie overall is funny. It's interesting. But this aspect of marketing is what caught my attention. Like we have people crazy for our product. We should double down on this. Like if they are loving our product, why don't we double down on this? Like, because we want to sell to these people like what the fuck <laughs> i i think that's uh, a big issue for people that grow with their product but they don't hire other people you know or that they want to be on top always i love uh, akio morita uh founder of sony who actually was uh very focused on marketing and if you read his biography, which is a very small book, but it's incredible, uh, he always had to fight like um, investors or even people on the same company and tell them, no, I know what I'm doing. This is going to work. You need to believe. But also, I was always, you know, um, astonished at how fast he was able to understand uh it's not the same for all the markets or we need to evolve this one i love it, the fact that when they create the walkman they knew it was going to be a success well at least he knew it was going to be a success and when i was reading he said that for japan they design like it have two plugs you know so you could share and listen music with another person with one walkman and when they send that to north america they realize uh they are not going to do that. Uh, so they just only put one plug. And it did work. It, it worked to the point that today, anything only have one plug for audio. And it doesn't have two unless you actually install uh, an extra one. So, you know, that ability to say, uh, let's adapt. Let's be fast on this. Uh, it, it needs to come from the understanding that what you do cannot be a matter of personal ego. You know, sure, if you're Steve Jobs, <laughs> you are designing things while you're managing a team that designed your vision. Uh, sure, yeah, okay, you have billions of dollars. It can be your ego, no problem. But in the everyday type of business or the business that is growing is not about you and it's not about your dream and it's not about how you think things are going to go but to them how things are actually going i will give you like on my personal side I want you to be an artist. Uh, when I was younger, I'm still an artist. I have an art career, but it took me a long time to accept that my talent was also good in marketing. 
I was probably on my late 20s when someone told me, hey, do you want to, to work on my new agency? And I was like, I don't, you know, I didn't study for this. And he was, no, but you have talent. You, you learn fast and you can learn on a different way. And once they invite me, it was pretty cool. And I started saying, oh, OK, I'm good at this. But a part of me was rejecting this path because it was like, but I'm an artist. You know, I, I draw and paint things nobody else can do. And at some point, I realized this is also who I am. And I need to follow this. And I need to become really good at this. And, and I end getting a lot of satisfaction. I mean, money is always good, and I can use that money to do all the art I want to do and keep that career going. Uh, I think that if I wasn't able to understand that, I would probably still try to be a full-time artist and just winning very low money, not having you know all the possibilities I have. And I'm very thankful for marketing because marketing gave me all that. Marketing taught me, okay, how do I need to think about my own career? How do I need to define success? It was just the ego that was against that. Once I understood there is no ego that has value on this world, uh, especially not when you're trying to survive or when you're trying to be successful, you need to go with the flow. And as people that are much more intelligent than me have said in the past, this means you make money of what you're good into, not exactly what is your passion. Well, with products, it's kind of the same. Your product is going to sell to whatever audience want it, not exactly the one you dream about it. That's OK. Your product may not change anybody's life, even if you thought it was going to be that. And sometimes you're going to be on meetings and somebody is going to tell you, what do you offer that the competition does not offer? And it's going to be very tough questions because you did this. You spent thousands of hours on this. You dream of this. You invest. You take the risk. And now somebody that never did the thing you did is telling you exactly what to do. And for some people, that's very hard. And I understand that. Uh, but they tend not to survive. Uh, I mentioned Alex Hormozzi already. But he also said, I, I don't know if it's his quote or he's repeating it. But he said, you can either be right or be rich. You cannot have both. Like, yeah. A lot of people prefer to be right. A lot yeah, of them. Yeah, that's your choice. That's up to you. I had I, the luck in my life yeah. that uh, that my ego was crushed when I was eighteen, and it taught me a great lesson. Like it told me, it taught me that there's a world where people are more skilled than you, more intelligent than you, <laughs> are better than you. You're not the best. You may be the best in your bubble, but uh, someone also told me that let's let's put it this way: a lot of people want to be the smartest person in the room. But a smart person told me that if you are the smartest person in the room, you should change the room because you're not <laughs> yeah. gonna, you're not going to grow. And if you want to grow, like your ego, ego is the first thing you need to silence to evolve. Like you can, like you said, you can have your ego or you can have success. Yes, and you know once you silence that. Again, you can be proud of what you do. You can love what you do. Uh, but once you silence that, it's no longer about you. It's about what it helps me to get there. And I think that is the main thing. Outreach always help you to get there. It's just you're going to have a lot of conversations there that are not going to be easy, but they're going to be very helpful. Yeah, so glad we're back on the topic of outreach. <laughs> because there's the most important question how do you do outreach marketing like we we partially covered the the topic like you need to mm -hmm. know your audience but how to reach out to people so that they allow you to establish relationships 
with them and actually do what you expect them to do or require them to do? Yeah. So I guess that if this was a LinkedIn post, it will be all about the relationship. It's not. Uh, <laughs> to be very honest, it depends exactly on what you're doing. But just to put it out there, a lot of this is just money. Contact them, negotiate with them, pay them. It's just transactional. In the meanwhile, there are a lot of rules that you need to follow to guarantee that that conversation starts. That's a technical thing, OK? And you're going to have a lot of experience, but it needs to be technical too. And then you can reach out and have success. Now, if you're reaching out in cold emails and you're not going to pay them and you're trying to convince them to do something for you, to consume something, even for simple thing as, you know, newsletter or email marketing, it's a series of steps previously have the right email, you know, just use a software that will check the email for you and tell you if you can contact this email or not. Be up to date on all the good practices to contact these people. Collect all the data, which is that's so important. Collect all the data and react to that data and make plans for the future. Do some A-B testing. But when the moment comes for that person to open the email, just be sure that is value there. And this, it depends on what exactly you want to do with outreach. But very important way of testing this, uh, if you're doing it by your own, you're just starting and you don't have the money, is write something that matters to you. Check it yourself and ask, does this matter? Is this, does this look good? You know, will I read this? And then if you're not sure or you're incredibly sure that, yeah, it matters, send it to friends. And a good strategy is send it to people that don't care about what you're trying to do and tell them, hey, do you care about this? And if they open the mail and they're like, I'm bored after the second line, I'm not going to read this or whatever, then you fail. And it's just adapt, adapt, and adapt till you reach to a template that you can say, OK, I think this is the one, and take it from there. When you're doing it on a large scale, you do all this. You have multiple things. You work in advance. But you need to be able to cut the reader attention, probably in 10 seconds. They need to engage with that, and then they will take it from there. That's the way to do it. Anything else, anything else is just overselling outreach. You know, if you're not able to cut your audience attention, your reader attention, even if this is a personal email to somebody, um, it's not going to move from there. And I'm surprised how a lot of people don't understand this, even when they do it on a daily basis. Um, they don't really understand, does this matter to me? Will I read it? Will somebody else will read this? I think that's a fact. And I will actually tell you something, since you're a copywriter, the best template writer I ever had was a copywriter. It was insane how fast and good it was, to the point where I actually learned to trust him more than I trusted myself on some of these things. That's all. So I, I got to ask you about the, the template the, that you said, mm -hmm. the, the best the best template you, you had that was written by this guy. What are the key elements of such template? Do you, do you remember it? Yeah, of Can course. Well, I did not really share an example because, you know, NDAs has been signed. So I that's not it's not going to go. But I can tell you the subject lines. Boy, subject lines are the first big challenge. Like if you're really good at subject lines, uh, you're going to be really good uh, 
at this. The second thing is exactly for what is the template. You know, if you're just trying to get the link in the site, if you're trying to write the newsletter, if you just want to secure a collaboration for your brand uh, with, you know, a content creator, it's it's usually go like hi usually avoid hello you know like hi no hi sir nothing like that if you have the name of the person stick the name of the person usually you can do this on a software that's going to do massive pitching for you and then short paragraph very to the point who you are what you want thank you best regards whatever you want to finish with and then your name you can add a signature to that you know if you're actually contacting them from a company it's always look good to look professional to have all the information sent now that's a very simple way to put it then you need to check that there are no spam words you have a lot of free spam word checkers online so you can put it in there and say okay if there anything in there that kind of looks that's gonna be flagged as spam that includes subject line and always avoid cheap tricks like there i receive a lot of emails that it looks like they're replying to something i sent which i never sent and i know that and i don't know why they think i don't know that and i even have open this one is really bad. I had a email software company pitch to my email because they wanted me to use it. And instead of just sending something and showing me why they're better, whatever, you know, or establish a conversation, they sent me a message like, hi, Fernando, uh, we have an opening that we think is good for you uh, in, in our company, you know? Uh, will you be open to have a conversation about it, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, please check our software and get to know it, you know, before we establish a conversation or a meeting. And how you realize that is insanely a lie that is trying to get you there is because it didn't say Fernando. It said, hi, you, sir. Um, it say we found a position in our company and after position, it said put relevant position to, to LinkedIn user. So you are like, you're really trying this. You're really trying to do this, you know. Uh, it's insane. And I will even go farther than that. When you're job hunting, you can, you know, apply to a lot of jobs and they will reply to you and tell you, oh, we're not going to continue with you. We have designed another candidate. However, we want to give feedback. And part of our feedback is we think you have more possibility if you do, you know, like a class on this or that. And by the way, we offer this. So here's a link to it. And you're like, do you really think I'm going to spend time doing that? So that's why I'm saying short paragraph, be honest with your intentions. If you want free links, which a lot of companies want, you need to be able to spend the time on that. You know, you need to be able to select them to say, okay, this one looks like a great place to do a collaboration. Do I have a writer that has published content that will show true value for this site when I establish a contact? And that is more and more the way it's going. So that's why I told you outreach opens all these doors that is not just go get me what I need, but it's more like, is this right? Do you have all these other things that actually you need? And yeah, that a lot of people don't like it and they don't want to invest on that. But, you know, it's their loss. I, I love these, um, these shitty cold emails that I sometimes <laughs> receive because you, you cannot have a company in Poland and not receive um, spam. I mean, you cannot even have an email address and not receive spam yeah. uh, spam emails. Uh, I began calling it uh, cold failing instead of cold mailing. And the absolute yeah. winner was some, let's say, marketing agency from Poland 
who just they want they were like a pro, an offer we have an offer like in the subject line we have an offer like yeah sure <laughs> here we go okay. yeah and i op- i clicked it just because uh, just because of how much i hated it i clicked it just to uh, yeah. just to scream at them in in the email and they go like <laughs> we have content services content marketing services we write blogs um product descriptions emails uh, yada 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 and we have experience we have a software we have some shit that didn't i i quit reading at this point and and i was thinking like um do you know what i do for a living like i do exactly what you do for a living why would i need that why yeah i mean i could outsource it and if they were like actually checking who are they mailing to and they were like we know you're good we know you we saw your work we saw your clients we saw your stuff online and we know you're good and because of your good you probably have no time for more clients so you can outsource some of your work to us for a margin we both happy what do you think and i would i would be and it wasn't the end of the story because they thought and one email is not enough so they send another one oh and yeah. it's not the end of the story because it's got a twist the second email was written with chat gpt you know <laughs> i'm opening the email and because <laughs> i i was i was livid after the first one so i thought the second one must be better and it was it delivered <laughs> i'm opening it and and the first line says um in the competitive digital marketing landscape, having a good quality content is crucial for maintaining in- engagement. Not only does yada yada yada, but it does, but it also. Uh, and I'm seeing the shit uh, I see from ChatGPT for past year, yeah. and I'm like, guys, this is disrespectful. Like this is like, it's insulting me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, did it. well, that's a lie. Like- yeah <laughs> that's like a outreach strategy anybody in outreach will tell you don't do that but that's that's a person from sales saying just send million emails somebody you know it's a number game somebody is gonna say yes and yeah sure somebody's gonna say yes but maybe even what you're doing is wrong and you need to develop a new strategy and you can do what you say hey this guy is really good why don't we get them on board why don't we try to get him more work actually and get a part of that based on his brand name you know like there are multiple ways but that is a conversation that needs to happen and for that you cannot have a leader that is to you know like to send a mail man just get me a client i used to have like also top 10 with with the team of insane emails trying to sell things uh when i think last year they were using chat gpt for multiple language translation and boy it was like get someone that speaks spanish on your team because it was so bad it was so bad it was like uh i remember it was like hello blah 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 uh again in this marketing world blah blah you have to bombard your uh enemies with, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like, what they're using to translate this? And I used to write to them back and say, you're not going to get any place with this. And to be honest, sometimes, sometimes I actually <laughs> uh, open these emails so they think it works. <laughs> they are like, oh, the open rate is great, which, by the way, open rate doesn't matter anymore. It's reply rate, click through rate, you know, all those things that matter. But I'm pretty sure they are. The open rate is great. Keep up with this. And follow ups, for God's sake, somebody needs to tell people stop sending follow ups. You know, it's like you're, you're incredible one nine and you're going to get blocked because of it. You send one initial email, right? You have the metrics. Was it open? Okay, maybe it was a bot that opened it, but whatever. Did it bounce? Let's start there. No, it did not bounce. Okay, are we sure we want to do a follow-up? Let's do it four days. 
Okay, in four days, do a follow-up. Now, don't do free follow-ups. Nobody wants free follow-ups. Do one follow-up. If they didn't reply on the first follow-up, and you are so sure this is the right one, maybe try a second one and put the end in there. But it's like, I don't know, it's like being toxic on your relationship, you know? Somebody say, no, just move on, man. Move on, you know? Like, asking again is not going to turn that into a yes. But yeah, it, you know, that's why you need to have a strategy. You do need to have a strategy. And you need to have a specialist that understands the numbers and tells you the hard truth. That's the case. Uh, so sometimes when I when I'm in a good mood and I receive a bad uh, cold email, I just copy it, and I quote it, and and uh, I reply. Um, do you need a man to do cold mailing for you? Because clearly, you don't know how to do it, and I do know how to do it. You should have written something like this, dear sir. Maybe not dear sir. Okay, let's not. Yeah, yeah. It. Dear Daniel, dear dear Fernando. Uh, we've seen that you are recently participated in a blah, 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 blah. Um, we have something that might interest you and bring value to you. Uh, it might save your time or make you money, whatever. And I open for conversation, something like this. Give value with your first email. I had one, one in my entire life, one cold email that converted. It was from FlexClip. There was this girl, Jennifer jessica something with jay and she said uh, hi i'm jennifer let's call her jennifer i'm jennifer and i work as an account manager in FlexClip. Uh, i saw you have uh, a website and an article with tools for copywriters we have a tool to create video what what do you say if uh, you give us link from this article and we give you our tool for free lifetime like um shit where do i sign yeah good deal yeah, that's that's good deal. That's the only ever cold email that converted. I I still have this tool today. I'm using it to to add subtitles to to my uh, short form content. So like that's a great deal for me. They have what they wanted. What's yeah. up with it? Yeah, it's like but that's somebody understanding exactly what they're doing and creating a strategy where they're like, we need users first and then we'll try to convert them to paid users, but they understand how. I like a year or two years ago, I was in the market looking for um email marketing software and I saw a lot of them. I signed up to a lot of things. I tried different softwares, free trials, and all that. And there was one that basically harassed me through a year trying to get me uh, signed with them. They contacted me on my personal LinkedIn, you know, my professional one. Um, they sent me emails like every day. And on some of these, you have to put your phone number, like it's not, not optional. And they had my phone number and they called me multiple times. And I was on vacation. I was um, on Brazil, you know, like having a good time. I work it hard. I am with my girlfriend. And I got a call from North America and I think might be one of my clients. This might be an emergency. They pick up and they're like, hi, my name is blah, blah. And I'm calling you because you try our software. I am. I, I was so angry. I was like, "Hey, are you from this?" And they were like, "Yeah." I was like, "Never call me in your life. I'm not gonna use your software. I, you know, I hate you. At this stage, I hate you." And I hang out and I block the number. Funny enough, uh, they sent me an email the day after saying, "Hey, my name is Dan." I understand that one of your callers bothered you. We're very sorry. We're not going to contact you anymore, blah, blah, blah. I was like, thank you. You know, like, don't do it. Jesus Christ, one month after, they called me again. And at that point, I well, used some of the tools to find, you know, a proper email to contact me, uh, to contact somebody in that company that actually was going to pay attention. And I sent them an official email, you know, from a like very professional looking and tell them this has happened. Uh, the next stage is I will make a post about it, you know, like 
if you want to go this this strategy, I will speak public about it. And they were like, we're very sorry, we don't want this to happen again. You know, here's a free coupon if you want to try our software, which is like, Jesus Christ. But you have to, to you know, you have to respect their, <laughs> how dedicated they were to this, and they never contact me again. So don't do follow-ups. Uh, I will say more than one follow-up, two if you're so sure. But, you know, you're not going to convince someone that is not convinced. That's the truth. Go work on your strategy and try again in three months. You know, don't drive people insane. Yeah, and bring value. Because I had uh, I had this one guy that said uh, he sent an email to me with an offer, obviously, because that's what they do. And I didn't reply. He waited a few days and and said that you didn't reply, and uh, I can I come back here because yada 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 yada. Uh, and I replied like did my lack of response didn't get you thinking it is a response no response it is a response it's no <laughs> you know like it's not that yeah. hard to understand that I means you yeah. could try because i opened it and he should have data that i opened an email and i didn't reply because i if i didn't open it it might miss i might i might have missed it like mm -hmm. i might have just see that yeah. ignore it I'll come back to that later and I will never come back. So you can, I think I would risk a statement that you can send a follow up if someone didn't open. But if yeah. someone opens and didn't reply. To be honest, a follow up, depending on how it's done, it can be successful even if the other person opened it and didn't reply. But it needs to be very to the point and you need to know you might be bothering somebody. So you need to address that. You need to say, hey, I don't want to bother you. You know, I'm just really interested in seeing if you have an opinion about this or not. And that's the end of it. And if somebody send me that email, I will open it. And, you know, I will be like, yeah, no, I don't want you to know about this. And this work, I have so many people add me on LinkedIn that they are selling gas posts. Jesus, it's driving me insane. And <coughs> I accept a profile. And they were like, you know, I check their profile and you can see that they are going to sell you something because they are outreach uh, for the last nine months on a company that doesn't exist or whatever. When they told me, hi, Fernando, because he accepted them, I wrote to them, yeah, please tell me this is not about selling guest posts. And they reply, yes, it is about that, but sorry. Uh, I won't mention anything. And then they delete me, you know, and I was like, that's good. This is a person that understand how not to bother. Ideally, don't add me on LinkedIn. On the other hand, I had a person add me, which it looked like a real profile. And they say, hey, I see, you know, your title. I think I have some sites that might be good, but before sending you a spreadsheet with a million sites for you to see that everyone has, do you have any requirements that it will help me, you know, to just send you a sample of 10 to 20 sites? Um, I was, yeah, I do have requirements. And I put very high requirements and they match it. I was like, okay, good. And I work it with them. So... That's why I say follow-ups can work if the person that is sending it to you, even if it is through software, actually thinks how somebody that don't want to get that email is going to react to it. That's quite a lot, a lot of information for, for us because well, some of us work as email writers, email mm -hmm. marketers, and part of me wants to ask you a question whether there's a market for us to reach out to people with cold emails i mean it could be a display of skill if a copywriter writes a good email to a company but on the other hand do we need to ask this question maybe because by the definition the copywriter should know how to write 
I mean, yes, a copywriter can be great at email marketing. I will say to any copywriter, go and try it. Uh, there are different rules. That's the thing. You know, your your text is going to be more, first is, is very short. But on the other hand, maybe you're writing newsletter. But I think they are good for it. I don't think that is a good uh, idea to say, I'm a copywriter, I can do it, because usually it demands a lot more. I think the way you can think about that is, I'm a copywriter, so I have a very strong understanding of how to get people attention, but I need to know the technical part. And you, what you do is you take great skill and you adapt it. Uh, I think copywriters, to be honest, uh, they're also good at influencer marketing. They're good at writing YouTube scripts. Copywriting is like the basis of everything. And this is so important because even before advertising went to, you know, create images to sell, the copywriting was so important. It's still so important. And I have this, you know, belief that the things you can say with words, you can't really say it on other way because words matter and they give a context. The wood ones, of course, not the fan fictions you're going to find on the internet. And it gives a context and it teaches us things. And well, in marketing, there is more like, uh, we're not artists here, so don't come with those things. I think copywriters, good copywriters, have that passion. You know, they are able to do it. But the most important thing is anybody that have a talent, can they call that talent on the moment they need it? You know, that's what makes you a professional. Are you passionate about cars? No? Okay. Can you write something that shows true passion about cars? That's your talent being called on the demand of a task. It's always the same, you know? So can a copywriter write great email marketing? Hell yeah, they can do. If they are able to call that talent, if they are now, unless you gave me a thousand words, I'm not able to do it then you don't really have, you know, you're not a professional. You just have a knack for something. It's not the same. Uh, it gets me thinking every time because some some copywriters in our country, they, they nag about the fact that they cannot convince the client to work with them. And I'm thinking, like, I've seen their approaches. I've, I've seen their attitude and the the ways, the attempts, they're trying to convince you to hire them. And sometimes the attempt is just one sentence on, on a messenger. Like, I can take this job. I'm free. Something like this. And that's it. And, and it, it gets me thinking, like, your job is to convince other people to change their beliefs, to change their mind, to make them act differently. The conversion is the change of... Uh, of status quo. It's not sales. It's not signups. It's the conversion happens every day. The conversion is change. That's the definition. Mm -hmm. And if you can't convince your client to hire you, how do you convince his clients to buy his stuff? Yeah, that's because a lot of people, again, what I was saying is in marketing, technically, we're not artists. We're not doing art here. We're creating something for a product or a service, that's also a kind of understanding that you need to be able to sell what you do. You need to be able to explain why. And that also goes with the ego. You are not Ernest Hemingway in Cuba writing. You know, you are a writer. Um, you have to be good with words. Imagine if you enter into a meeting and you don't know how to express yourself or in an email, you don't really convince anyone and uh, you're like just check my work man you know i'm really good well that's never enough it's a hard part a hard part to sell yourself 
But you're in this industry, you need to learn and you need to learn really fast how to do it. Yeah, that's that's true. We're approaching to the end and my yeah. favorite questions. What was your toughest assignment in your career? What was the the toughest challenge? What was the hardest thing you had to do for money? Yeah. Oh, well, I have worked for clients. I probably didn't want to work on when I was starting, you know, um, but I think it matters of having to learn. It was when I started, I thought I was going to be not rich and that was all I was going to manage a software and send emails. And the more and more I grew on my career, I got to management position and I got this client that hired me full time and they were like, we have very little money to do this and we need you to help us create a team that can carry on with this and we need you to be successful on the strategy and up to that time I was used to work only with specialists. So we were all on the same level, we will speak the same things and everything had an understanding. And when I moved from an SEO agency to a different type of client, I realized, oh, these people have no idea. And they're going to hire people that have no idea what they're doing. And I have to create a system that guaranteed they understand the task and they can become good at their task. And at the same time, I have to deal with a client that wants to be successful, but they don't understand how to be successful. And it was, it was really difficult work to be done. First, because they overhire, they have it like multiple, multiple people, very cheap. And I was like, first thing, let's, you know, let's keep the talent and then let's use that money to, to bring real people in here or to see other, you know, like I was more focused on, okay, nobody that come from SEO or outreach is going to take for this salary. Let's bring people that are in sales because if they know how to sell, they will know how to approach this and then, then train them. But it will take three months to guarantee their good training. And you take it from there and then you have to deal with all that. And it went to a place where we were successful. We did a great launching. After that, you know, it was time for me eventually to move on to another type of strategy. But I do remember thinking how hard I was working uh, with no other specialist in the team. And it helped me understand too how I needed to explain things because till that part, it was I will come and everyone was on the same page and I never needed to say, well, this is why you have to do this. Everyone was like, yeah, this is what we need to do. And I never had to even fight for an idea. And that was the first time in my career that I told somebody, you need to trust me. I need to trust what I'm saying, because if not, you're going to hit the wall and we need to pay attention to this. And it put me on a different place with my career and with my abilities and helped me God where I am now. That's a nice, nice story. And now, what was the worst client in your life? <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay, yeah. Let's not say names. I... Disclaimer. I... The worst yeah. client you're allowed to talk about legally and you yeah, don't have yeah. an NDA to break. That's, I that's can't, it. I cannot say their name. I will never say a client name, you know, even if I don't like their work or we didn't end in the best of terms, it's, it's important to be professional. This company can be said because they are no longer in line, mainly because the owner uh, <laughs> was insane. You know, like he had it, everything to be very good and he micromanaged and he was insane. Like there is no other way to say it. I went to meetings with him and I was not even sure if he understood what he was doing. So this guy that had a job 
uh, in his family company. It was finance. Eventually, uh, the father dies and he, you know, get the company, but he's not really uh, ready. But he have a good idea. He realized um, people in this country are not going to invest in finance. Uh, there are all these new tools that allow you to invest yourself. So this was when crypto was really hot a couple of years ago. And he was like, let's adapt and use our past experience to create a guarantee of security and sell our uh, you know, service of we're going to help you understand crypto. Uh, we're going to get you there. Um, initially, it was a good idea. They came to me and they were like, what do we do with this and that? Before them, I had worked with a crypto client that also teaches people how to do crypto, which was a very smart guy, actually. You know, I had an idea on how to sell it, but this other company had a real structure, and this one was very new on to it. And they were like, just give me ideas what you what we can do. And I was like, look, influencer marketing is working really good. It will give you conversion, but you need to pay them or give them something. Eventually, they decide they wanted to do an affiliate program. They buy a lot of crypto, they have a lot, and they were like, we're going to pay them in crypto if they bring us users. I was like, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, why don't you pay them a part of the money that people pay for, you know, the training, because that is in dollars and it will be better for them. And they were like, no, they need to buy and they need to want to use crypto. And I was like, okay, that's the first challenge because not everyone wants that will try. I did a market research and I came to them and told them, look, finance influencers are not going to touch this. You know, they, they have a branding. They, they're not so sure about crypto. They are not so sure this is a scam or not. We we're talking with when the NFT was starting to, you know, pump. So it was kind of like that bubble. I was like, there is a lot of talking. Let's stay away from them. But I have an idea. Let's go to influencers that talk about politics. Um, because usually what happens is on YouTube, for example, a lot of them use TV news clips. So they cannot monetize that YouTube video. And they cannot monetize other things. So I was like, let's go to them and tell them, you know, uh, just sell this, put it, uh, we'll pay, you know, a fee on crypto. It's really good, blah, blah, blah. It will work. We did it. And it worked. And, you know, we found out that people that are more on the right uh, wing of politics were, like, really interested in this. They were really, you know, consuming this. And it was going fine. So I went to them and tell them, why don't we go to the left too and do the same? Crypto can be sell, you know, as this ideal solution. Um, the guy didn't want that because of his personal beliefs. I was like, but this is about money. This is not about personal beliefs. And both sides have an interest and both sides are your audience. What people speak when they're selling your product, you know, it's just a moment, and then they have the right to express whatever they want on their own channels, and you decide. Of course, you're not going to go with a crazy one that, you know, let's take the arms or thing like that, but they have the right to have an opinion on whatever is going on in the country and anything. So let's go to both sides. And he didn't want it. So from there, it started to get complicated because he was convinced like he convinced himself that maybe his team uh, was from the left. And it was like, this is marketing. Marketing doesn't have, uh, you know, like we're not right, left, center. We just sell things. We don't have that way of thinking. If you have the product, the service, and the money, we will create the strategy for you. That's as simple as it gets. Of course, ideally, you know, I want to be able to go to sleep 
while doing this type of work. But in this case, it was very simple work. Um, he became insane. Uh, he became insane. He started demanding daily meetings. He will ask very strange questions. And then it took to the place where he was in the middle of the strategy. He decided he wanted people talking about him. And we were like, that's different strategy and you need to build it differently. And he was like, no, but you know, my family has been in this business so many years and I'm the new one. And I was like, yeah, but that's for different type of people. These people don't care about you. Just you need to write, you, you need to change that, but it takes time. It got so toxic that at the end of the day, I had a meeting where he didn't want to pay the team because he thought, uh, yeah, even if he was being successful, he thought the team was not working under the impression that he was the, the you know, number one leadership on the company. Like he was the supreme leader. And if they didn't recognize that, he didn't want to pay them. And uh, at that stage, I was like, look, I won't tell you what to do. I recommend not doing that because of the reputation of your brand and because it's wrong, but especially because of the reputation of the brand. So I'm out of here. You know, like, I'm not going to be part of this. I don't think this is the way of doing it. And I work one more month, create, you know, like the next step of the strategy and I leave. And most people leave that uh, company in a period of three months. And it happened what it happened. It got a bad reputation online. And it was just based on the ego of a person. Like everything else was working. Everything was working. It was just his ego. And it took me a lot of time to understand that the problem he had, it was he was competing with his father, who was dead, and who was, has been very successful. And he wanted that status. And he thought this was going to give that status. The only problem is he never mentioned it. And for some reason, he he allowed his own, you know, um, politic views to get in the middle of a really good amount of money because he could have created a lot of profits for himself. So I think that was the worst, worst client I ever had. And micromanagement from insane people, especially it's incredible insane, like people telling you, I don't like that word. And you're like, there is no word there. And when you're working with influencers, you need to allow them to give them freedom on how they speak about certain things. And he was like, no, I want them to mention me. I want them to do this. It gets to a point when, when the only thing you can think is, I'm out of here. You know, I hate this job. I'm out of here. It pains me. It pains me because it was a good idea at the right time with right money backing it up and a person just took that down it didn't work that's the first story in this podcast of a company that was doing good but ended up bad because it's it's not unexpected to face negative experience from a company that struggles that's mm -hmm. not selling well that's not having money it's not having an idea, strategy, and when it's not working out, but having a company, a working company, a company making profit dead because of your ego, that's beyond me. Like, what the hell? It happens more than you think. A lot of people uh, create a company and take it to a level where you are like, this guy is going to have a job all his life because he have a great company and they don't want to do it. I work it for an agency that didn't want to get into politics and it was a very good decision because, you know, they didn't need to do it. Uh, but when COVID came, it hit them really bad and they lost a lot of the contracts they had. And I think that at some point you need to understand that, you know, some things you might not want to do it, but they're going to give you a certain level of security. And especially it's not about you. 
when you have a company, it's not about you. You know, you're not the company. If you think you are the company, it's not going to work. Got it. That's a tough lesson to learn to, to silence. Like the ego comes up and comes up uh, over and over in this conversation. So we were sp supposed to talk about Irish marketing and we ended up uh, giving a motivational speech on how to <laughs> silence the ego. But I think it's, it's not happening without the reason. So I think there's there's a value in it. And uh, there is a value in the, in an hour and 50 minutes of this recording. So we'll be heading towards the end. And the last question is, where can we find you online? Uh, well, I will say LinkedIn. That's probably the <laughs> number one place that's to contact me. So we can put a link there. Um, I, I am working on a um, personal agency, uh, but that side will be up pretty soon because I'm trying to create a system that guarantees the client that they don't overpay. Uh, and there is a lot of strategy and structure uh, before being able to, to launch this. You know, a lot of agencies have, they became really big up to 50 to 100 employees. And when a new client comes, they have like, yeah, really good structure, but also it doesn't allow them to take certain clients that will be a great success case. And I'm trying to create something more focused on let's create success cases for all our clients and let's try to take those challenges too. So if somebody has a small company, why not give them, you know, the best talent we can give them. So when it comes, I have, of course, business partners and we're working on the structure to guarantee that. And we found the client have to pay $15,000 a month from the start, you know, and more focus on let's just have a number that works for everyone, but allows us to do a great job. And because we know so many specialists, what we're doing too is inviting them to work with us, but more on a partnership kind of level. So that's my big project right now, but I'm always taking clients. I'm always taking calls. I love creating strategies. Uh, probably these days, what I do the most is create outreach strategies and team strategies. So I'm also quite focused on that. And yeah, LinkedIn for now is the best place. Cool, cool. Once your website is done, uh, we'll add a link to it also. And well, thank you for today. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the knowledge, the motivation, the inspiration. Thank you um, on behalf of my audience and uh, have a great day. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. It was a pleasure being here. Cheers. Cheers. Odcinku z Fernando to tyle. Trochę trwał i był po angielsku, więc nie ma łatwo, ale mam nadzieję, że wyciąga z niego jakąś lekcję dla siebie. Jaka to lekcja? Napisz w komentarzu. A jeżeli znasz kogoś, kto zarabia pisząc maile do newsletteru, kto uprawia cold mailing, kto uprawia outage marketing, kto mógłby wyciągnąć wartość tego odcinka, pokaż mu go. Będzie, na pewno będzie Ci wdzięczny. 